ABC Listen. Podcasts, radio, news, music and more. What happens when medicine is sold like a makeover? Their marketing is very good. Clinics with five-star reviews selling miracle cures. I left that place thinking I found myself a solution. But it's your body that pays the price. I had one cheek higher than the other, one cheek further out from my nose. Before and After, a new series on how medical hype spreads online, who profits and who pays. Search for Background Briefing on the ABC Listen app or wherever you get your podcasts. Our peak scientific body has invented a lot, like AeroGuard, plastic banknotes, and, well, where would we be without Wi Fi? But once again, the CSIRO is axing jobs. Today, author, comedian, and ambassador for mathematics and science at Sydney Uni, Adam Spencer, on what happens when we slash science funding. I'm Sam Hawley on Gadigal Land in Sydney. This is ABC News Daily. Adam, we're going to get to the latest round of job cuts at the CSIRO in a moment, but let's just consider for a moment the role of the government-funded science agency because it's been around for a long time, right, since Federation, and it's done a fair bit of stuff in that time. Yeah, it is. It's Australia's national science agency. It does a mixture of things. It does some important research that the private sector won't take up. It sort of guides research efforts, coordinates a lot of research efforts across disparate fields. It's been responsible for some amazing inventions that Australians use every day that they probably don't know. Every time you hand over a polymer banknote anywhere in the world, that CSIRO technology that was brought in back in the 1960s to overcome a forgery scandal. Every time you spray on uh, insect repellent, uh, that that was created by the CSIRO. Every time you use Wi-Fi, You're using mathematical algorithms designed by the CSIRO actually initially for a problem in cosmology and astronomy, but applied to Wi-Fi, an incredible range of inventions over the years, and just a lot of nuts and bolts day-to-day research that makes Australia smarter and and match fit for the 21st century. Yeah, it also came up with self-twisting yarn. I don't know exactly what that is, but it sounds pretty good. (laughs) Yeah, any time I'm at home self-twisting some yarn while on Wi-Fi and spraying myself with AeroGuard, I think of the CSIRO. <laughs> All right. Well, of course, it's been a really bad time for the organisation because it is now announced that it will be cutting up to 350 jobs. Now, that does sound like a lot. It's really unfortunate, I think, this news, not only for the individuals involved, but people have to understand science is not just a process you can walk away from, come back three weeks, six months, two years later and start again. It's not like building a house where if you get a bit of wet weather, you can stop for a few weeks, come back and take up where you left off. If a scientific project stops, if a research unit breaks down, if someone leaves the field and goes and does something else, That's a bubble that passes through sometimes for years before it writes itself. I'm loathe to just criticise for the sake of criticism, but any time there are substantial cuts to Australia's research profile and scientific profile, it, 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 it has a magnification beyond just the simple dollars and cents that you're talking about. There are some projects that will stop and never be taken up again. There are other projects that were important by definition, if the CSIRO was doing them, that are going to take yeah, incredible impact from these cuts. And I think that's a really unfortunate thing. Yeah. All right. Well, the chief executive, Doug Hilton, he says the cuts are required for a few reasons, because funding is not keeping up with inflation, but also because of this shift to AI. And if you think about 10 years ago, we weren't talking much about AI, whereas now almost every every program of science that we do thinks about AI. So we've needed to be able to hire people that are fantastic computational scientists, whereas we probably didn't need to do that 30, 40 years ago. So we have... There's a lot of companies and a lot of organisations that are having to deal with that. Look, it's a matter of priorities. These things aren't worth doing if they're not being funded sufficiently. Absolutely, that's the case. But as a nation, as a nation that's always fought above our weight when it comes to scientific output, 
I think it beholds us to continue to fund these services appropriately. We just had an Aussie win one of the Nobel Prizes recently for a redefining work in the world of chemistry. When you look at the number of Nobel Prize winners that Australia's produced mm. per head of population, it's amazing what we've done. Two Australian Nobel laureates are basking in success after winning this year's prize for medicine. Dr Barry Marshall and Professor Robin Warren discovered that stomach ulcers are caused by bacteria and not by stress or diet as had commonly been believed. The Australian-born academic Professor Elizabeth Blackburn helped change the way scientists think about ageing and disease with her pioneering work into the building blocks of life. Australian scientists have today been celebrating their colleague Richard Robson, who's been awarded the Nobel Prize for Chemistry. An Australian astrophysicist has won the Nobel Prize for Physics. 44-year-old Brian Schmidt was one of three scientists awarded the prestigious prize for their work on the study of supernova and the expansion of the universe. When we back our scientists in, in the really important fields at the moment, like quantum research, like artificial intelligence and the like, it's incredible what we do. And this research pays for itself in the long time. The multiplier effect of the IP that's produced, the technology that's produced, the patents that are produced, the companies that are spun out and things like that, pay back multiple dollars for each dollar we put in. That's what makes me feel this is a, a short-sighted and unfortunate state of affairs. Sure, and it's not the first time, of course, that we've seen cuts like this. In the past 18 months, 800 jobs have actually gone, and we saw pretty big cuts during John Howard's years when he was Prime Minister. Tony Abbott, of course, he also cut it. There was huge controversy, wasn't there, back in 2016 when cuts to climate research were announced. It's really unfortunate. The CSIRO does some world-class work, and world-class work on particularly Australian problems, the science of bushfire, the science of the natural sort of climate challenges and catastrophes we will face in this country more pronounced because of our unique biodiversity, our unique climate. The research that goes on there won't go on anywhere else in the world. I think it's really important that Australia considers long and hard before we cut to areas of scientific endeavour like that. then, Adam, let's consider more deeply how these cuts will affect us and what it means for us as a nation. Because, let's face it, a nanosecond ago, we were reminded, weren't we, just how important scientists are during the pandemic. It is a major turning point in the year-long battle against COVID-19. Britain's mass vaccination program is now underway. That's the same vaccine for which Australia has signed a deal to get 10 million doses. The Pfizer vaccine was approved to be rolled out across Australia earlier this week. It is facing some delays. Then there's this other vaccine, the AstraZeneca vaccine, and that's the vaccine that most Australians will be getting. But it's also facing some delays. Vaccines did not come out of Australia, the COVID vaccines, did they? They came out of Britain, they came out of the United States, and basically that does mean, as Australians, we didn't get first dibs on them. I mean, it, it, there's a lot at stake when it comes to science. Oh, absolutely, and if you look at the... Look, look at the tech companies that are dominating the world economy and basically keeping the world economy going at the moment. They are all intellectual endeavours, but Australia plays in that field. Look at the Atlassians, look at the Canvas, look at the world-class work we're doing in quantum sciences. You would assume quantum technology is so detailed and so expensive and so technical that only a few places in the United States or perhaps Europe could do it. But the work that's going on with Michelle Simmons at the University of New South Wales, with the Nano Lab at the University of Sydney, with Psi Quantum in Brisbane is absolutely absolutely world-class work and one of the world's most cutting-edge and important fields that if we get it right will define a lot of industry and technology going forward for the rest of this century. Australia's doing incredible work there. Our best scientists are as good as any in the world and they're great collaborators. They build out great teams and networks around the world. We just have to back our scientists in the same way that we so proudly back our athletes to always perform at a world-class level, in the same way we back our artists, our movie makers, our musicians to perform on the world stage. We've just got to back our scientists because if we back them financially, they produce incredible gains for us and for the country, for the world. There is an associated brain drain, isn't there? Scientists actually, Australian scientists, heading overseas because that's where 
the work is funded properly and most interesting. Well, not only Australian scientists heading overseas, but world-class overseas scientists who were working or thinking of coming to work in Australia. It's a really big decision to take your family and move them to the other side of the world for what might only be a three-year contract. Mm. Any uncertainty, any unpredictability in Australia's scientific landscape threatens our ability to collaborate with people around the world and get the best brains coming here. And yes, the flip side of that coin is great Australian brains going and working and living and taking their intellectual capital overseas. A double loss for the country. What about the longer term implications of this? Because how important in your mind is research and development? Now, we're pretty good in this country at uh, digging out things from the ground, that's for sure. But I guess that's not going to last forever. No, and the big thorny problems the world wants to solve, the challenges of climate, complex diseases that don't seem to respond to our best medical technologies yet, growing booms in artificial intelligence and other applied technologies, they are thorny problems that need smart people, well-funded to think about, to get breakthroughs with. Yes, there are challenges that AI is bringing to certain industries, but AI is also turbocharging our ability to design novel drugs to take on diseases we can't currently fight, etc. Such a fertile, exciting area of research. The last thing we want to do is cut off the pipeline of great Australian minds going through high school and university at the moment who are making decisions about what they want to do with the rest of their life. We don't want people aged 17, 18, 19 saying, I was thinking of being a scientist, but what's the point? Yes. We want the best and the brightest Australians to consider a lifetime in science for our benefit and the benefit of the world. Yeah, and it's good for the economy, right? World-class science insulates and builds an economy going forward. The multiplier effect of money that's spent well in science for the creation of further jobs, uh, technology, industry, economic benefit, the multiplier effect is profound. Good money, well spent going in, generates a lot more coming out. Right. Well, Adam, the Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, he argues that the dollars need to be going into the right areas, that Labor is a friend of science, but it's a matter of priorities. We are supporting scientific research. What we're making sure is that the funding is going in the right directions. And what uh, the staff there will know is that there's a substantial increase in staff. A substantial increase uh, was made in previous budgets. The cuts don't sound friendly, but, you know, governments have to determine the best place for this money to go, right? No government ever says we're cutting money to science because we don't like science. Well, there's the occasional person in the United States saying that at the moment, but the vast yes. bulk of the time, the government's cut back on science. They don't do it because they say we don't like spending on science. There's always the argument of the best money's got to go into the right places. But I don't think you can look at the CSIRO over the last decade and say it's been bludging away and just wasting money willy-nilly. Uh, the, the returns from the CSIRO and the quality of work that is done there for the paltry budget it was already receiving, I would say was world-class. I don't think it's a fair knock on the CSIRO to say it could be using the money more wisely. While the, the government's defending it, I mean, there are some really concerned people. The independent senator, David Pocock, he is really worried about this decision. I got the par parliamentary library to, to look at uh, CSIRO funding, and we are at record lows um, per capita as a percentage of GDP. We've never invested uh, less in the CSIRO. And when you go back to 2014, when the Abbott government was making cuts, very similar lines from the Abbott government there. So this is... This is so worrying from the Labor government. At the same time that they are... There are universities, of course, still doing science, if you like, but, I mean, their funding's strained too. And the role of the CSIRO is that sort of national flagship, doing work that some private industry wouldn't do, but also coordinating the work with universities, with industries and the like, is a crucial part of the CSIRO's role. And in some ways, all areas of the community that might want to dabble in or work in science suffer when the CSIRO suffers. Mm. Well, just tell me, Adam, then, in your mind, what do you think these latest cuts say about Australia as a nation? Australia as a nation has a proven track record in this area. We seem to be turning our back on that. We should be backing our scientists to continue to do the world-class work they've done for decades. And you'll even look at the position of science minister. We've only had, I think, Ed Husick in the last government was the first science minister to serve a full parliamentary term as science minister since Barry Jones in the 1980s. 
the leadership of science in this country, I think we could give a far greater vote of trust in our scientists, both financially and in terms of the way we serve them with broader infrastructure. Adam Spencer is an author, comedian, and ambassador for mathematics and science at Sydney University. This episode was produced by Sydney Peed and Cinnamon Nippard. Audio production by Sam Dunn. Our supervising producer is David Cody. I'm Sam Hawley. Thanks for listening. <laughs>